Hello, my name is Taya Graham and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As I always make clear, this show has a single purpose, holding the politically powerful institution of policing accountable. And to do so, we don't just focus on the bad behavior of individual cops. Instead, we examine the system that makes bad policing possible. And today, to achieve that goal, we will be showing you this video of an arrest by a Massachusetts cop of a man who refused to show identification. But it's what the officer did after the man who took the video fought for his rights and how his charges contradicted what we will see on camera that will be the subject of the show today. An example of how law enforcement can turn mundane situations into life altering trauma. But before we get started, I want you watching to know that if you have video evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate for you. Please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can always message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And if you can, please leave a like or a comment to help share our work with other people who care about justice and accountability. All right, we've gotten that out of the way. Now, one aspect of American policing we have covered extensively on our show is a topic that seems simple, but isn't. Namely, the seemingly limitless ability for police to ask for or even demand identification. It's a question that usually focuses on the legal ramifications. In other words, when can a cop demand your ID and what rights do you have if you refuse? But there is more to this question than just criminal code or legal procedures, because the fact that there are so many scenarios when police can make the ultimatum, produce your ID or else, that it's worth unpacking the broad implications of this power on both our lives and our rights. And no video is a better example of what I'm talking about than the fraught encounter with Weymouth, Massachusetts police I am showing you now. It happened when resident Paul Brophy and a friend were sitting in the parking lot of a convenience store in Weymouth in October in 2019. His passenger had just purchased some snacks and cigarettes when an officer approached their car. Watch. So Personal. let's talk about what I'm asking you for. You cooperate, give me your ID, we see who you are, we can send you on your way in short time. But because now you're prolonging this situation okay. because you're being, you know, defiant. No, I'm not being defiant. Yes, I asked you for an ID, simple request. You I said respectfully, officer. That's not I, respectfully, no, that's actually I, defiant. Well, you're escalating now. What's that? You're escalating. I'm not escalating. I mean, it's about de de-escalation. Okay. No, can we talk to each other? You're a public I, servant. I'm. I was. I'm. A, I'm I, a public servant. Th then why are you being defiant? Why I'm not you being offer, defiant. Offer, I'm not being defiant. I'm defending ID, my rights that you ask, swore to to, to, to protect. ID, ask for an ID. You offer the ID. You be. You be. You will be sent on your way shortly after. Mm -hmm. Now, as you can see, it's clear the officer is completely unable to share what's known as reasonable articulable suspicion that Paul committed a crime. That is generally the standard for making what's known as a custodial stop or where you're not free to leave until the officer says so. In fact, he seems pretty much at a loss to even articulate why he's talking to the two men at all. And I say this ironically because it appears the officer thinks that the routine act of parking and purchasing a snack is actually nefarious. Take a look. Why can't you produce an ID? Well, it's about the Constitution. <laughs> Mom, yeah. Okay. Well, what, what, which, right. which part of the Constitution? The First Amendment. The First Amendment? It's probably not the first. That's what the uh, Assembly the and fifth. all that. It's the fifth. But it's the fifth. I'm not pleading the fifth. Uh, see, clearly, you don't even know the Constitution. So. Off by heart, or, no, I or, don't. Or your constitutional rights, because do, do you? what you're saying <laughs> You is, should is advise right. me of my rights now. Mario. You should be helping me. I'm, I'm, I'm asking what you to help your me. What is your name? I'm asking you to help me. Can I ask you what's oh, your no. name? My name's Steven. What's oh, your no, name? Well, can I see your, if, are you detective or? No. Well, can I see your, your name tag? We don't have name tags. Okay. Are you going to operate this motor vehicle? I had planned to leave when he said we were loitering, yeah. Okay. Well, who who just talked to leave, officer? If like, you're going to operate this motor vehicle, I need to know if you have a valid a license, license to get, drive the motor vehicle. give him your ID. You so know. let me see that's your ID. That's not no, my can problem. Go right from there. That's, not, that's not my issue. Come on now. Well, that, clearly, if you're going to drive this motor vehicle away, 
I need to know if you are a valid licensed operator. That way I can find that out. How am I going to find that out? By you producing me an ID. No, I'm sorry. You I'm don't produce me an ID, you don't drive this vehicle away. Okay. Whatever you say, officer. That's what I say. You're in charge. That's correct. Now, it's worth noting that Paul, at his own risk, refuses to relinquish his rights. In fact, even as the officer escalates the encounter, Paul attempts to de-escalate, all the while simply trying to protect the rights enshrined in the Constitution. Just watch. So if you're not going to Power and control. ID, it's all about power and control. No, it's yes, not it power is. and control. <laughs> Everyone's it's a me criminal. Doing my job. It's Everyone's me doing my job. a criminal. It's me doing my job. Why why do you look at people like they're criminals? Do I look like a criminal to you? So have I looked at you like a criminal? I asked you yeah, for you No, know, you've talked to me like I'm a criminal. No, believe me, trust me when I tell you. No. I've talked to people like they're criminals. I'm not talking like a criminal. So mm -hmm. rest assured. I'm asking you for your ID. I'm you want to operate this motor vehicle? Respectfully you... refusing. Okay, then I'm going to respectfully tell you that you're going to be getting out of this motor vehicle because you're not going to drive the motor vehicle without a license that I know that you're a valid licensed operator. Of course, at this point, you're probably saying, why doesn't he just hand over his license? Why not just give the cop what he wants? Why be what the mainstream media likes to call a troublemaker? Well, let me briefly address that before I show you what happened next, because the sequence of events you're about to see will certainly answer that question full stop. First, what are the point of our rights if they are strictly conditional? How are the First Amendment, which guarantees our ability to move about without government intervention, and our Fourth Amendment, which protects us from unwarranted searches, meaningful at all if we need permission from a person with a gun and a badge to invoke them? Seriously. And if you don't think how and when we can invoke rights are important, take a look at what happens next. You're escalating now again. You're getting no. louder. Uh, whether I'm getting louder or not has nothing to do with it. Apparently, you don't understand that right now, you not producing an ID. You're standing up for my means, rights. Means, and I'd means stand up for yours, to too. Drive this motor I'd vehicle. stand up for yours, too. And I did. Although, be he, that as he it He was may, very aggressive. If, if this... Guy. You're... When he came to the window. You're ignorant. If this situation has provoked me. Clerk has called us. <laughs> yes. So what, what did the clerk say? Me. Can I ask? I, I have not spoken to the clerk. Yeah. But what we got transmission rides over the radio. Yes. What, what that, that he was suspicious about the activity was going on, which means there's a potential for a crime. Okay. Yes. I understand if, that. If there's a potential for a crime. Yes. Have, are, or about to commit a crime. I have every right to ask. For your ID, if you believe or or are under suspicion, okay. bingo. Well, suspicion well, that is that suspicion it's doesn't give you a suspicion. And at that point, we have the right to ask for an ID. Okay. No, you and don't. Because you are under suspicion for that potential it's, crime it's, that may or may a, not be going on. It's a touchy area. It's for us to investigate. I understand. I understand. It's a touchy area, though. It's a great area. I can see area. the Correct. difference. But clearly. now that we got to the point where he no, wants to drive area, this motor vehicle away. Yeah. He needs to produce an ID. Oh, but you don't know if that, that, that guy going up the street has a valid driver's license. Calm down. That guy going up the street isn't part of a criminal right. investigation. A criminal investigation? Oh, no, no. It's not a criminal investigation. There's a potential criminal investigation here. If I assert my rights, I'm have, not being uncooperative. You haven't officer. told me why. You haven't told me your name. I did tell you my name. No. I, I asked you for your name tag, and you said that. We, we don't have name tags. No name tag. I just badge I numbers. What's your badge number? There's no number on my badge. There's no number on this badge. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have a badge number? So do how see, do I know you're a cop? Do you see a number on the badge? Because I have a badge. And it says police right on here. Man, I, I could get one of them car. online. I have a police car right there. Want to see it? Want to see the police? It says it right on the side of it. Well, in this day and age, you know. Do you want to see the police? It says it right on the side of the car. Come on out. I'll show you. Just check it out. Yeah, I can see it. Come on out. I can see it. Inspect the car. Step out. I'll show you it. Okay. Inspect it. Show out. Come on. You convince me. I'm not like giving anyone permission to go out. into my car. No, you don't have no right. Why, why do you want me to step out of the car? I'm not so stepping out of the so car. You can, so you can not a chance. Yeah. Now, hold on. So can, can I close my door? So you can see Let me close my door. I don't want to see it. I'll tell you right now, you just put your hands on me. That's why I'm grabbing you. All right? You just put your hands on me. That's why I'm grabbing you. Are you now, gonna let that, hey, now, hey. now what we have here is a different scenario. You're being aggressive. 
And now I'm going to ask you out of this vehicle. Give me a license. I'm going to ask you out of this vehicle. I'm, let you go. I'm not going to give me your ID. Can I get a go. supervisor, please? Can I get a supervisor? You can get 10 supervisors. Now. Can I get a supervisor now? Listen to your this buddy. Is, this give is me how your ID. Listen, can you just give me your ID. Let, can you let go of his arm? Arm? My my arm? arm? Officer. No. Why? Because I'm not, I don't feel safe right now. Right, right. Would you I reach don't feel out, safe getting out, out of the car. I have a taser and I have a gun. You, you can, reached out uh, to me uh, and I feel uh, unsafe uh, with please, you doing that. Listen to me. Look at me. Oh, so I what know. I'm going to do now oh, is me. I'm going to take me. you out of this car. Listen, please guys, if don't be harsh. Do don't be harsh with them, Step out please. on your own. Okay. I'll step out on please. my own. Is that a lawful it's order? It is a lawful order. Why, lawful why, order. why do you want me out of the car? Because I want to talk to you. show you something. All right? Now you're going to turn around. I'm not resisting. Oh, man. I don't know. I don't know what he did, but you're just detaining him for a minute? What are you doing? Just for a minute. Okay. Just so we get, we get an idea. All right. We can get the All right. supervisor in Thank you. That's all I'm asking for. Yeah, you'll get the... Oh, you're bringing me in? No. They're not bringing you in, dude. They're just detaining you for a minute. No, to... he said he, I'm going to see the supervisor in the station. No, the, yeah. the, you can call him here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to charge you. ABPO. See That's assault and battery on a police officer. Oh, assault and battery is any unwanted touching of somebody. This? I did you not re touch him. I reached I for watch you reach out. You reach, you reach for me? You got a taser right here. You reach for the dude my taser. That's right. The officer accused Paul of assaulting him and reaching for his weapons. I'm not kidding. After asking him to get out of the vehicle, he actually summons serious charges against him, assault and battery of a cop, all because he was parked in a car outside of a convenience store at the ungodly hour of 2 a.m. Now, we are going to talk to Paul Brophy about what happened, why he fought for his rights, and how this entire ordeal affected him. But first, I'm joined by my reporting partner, Stephen Janis, who's been looking into the case, researching the law, and seeking comments from the police. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Taya, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So first, what does the law in Massachusetts say about providing an ID to police when they ask. According to the ACLU of Massachusetts, it's really clear. The only time a police officer in Massachusetts can request your ID is when you're operating a motor vehicle, which clearly was not happening at this time. But really, I think this is a constitutional case. I think federal law governs here, and he was doing what anyone is allowed to do in this country, which is pretty much peaceably assemble without a cop going in and saying, who are you? So I think this is clearly a constitutional case, and I think that's the overriding concern here. You've reached out to both police and prosecutors. How are they justifying the charges? Well, Taya, I reached out to Weymouth Police. I sent them a video of the arrest. They sent me back the police report, and it is extraordinary and telling. Now, the entire probable cause in this case was a man going in and out of a convenience store and getting in and out of a motor vehicle. That was the whole basis for a crime investigation. But even more important, there are no notes about the police officer talking to the clerk in the store and trying to understand or discern why this was so disturbing. But really, there was no basis for a crime. There was no basis for a criminal investigation. If going in and out of a store is a crime, well, I'm a criminal, you're a criminal, we're all criminals. It's pretty scary what the officer used to construe this encounter and, and this sort of custodial stop. And then the officer, I think, really embellished. Actually, embellished is not even really adequate to describe it. He said that, you know, Paul went out and grabbed him by the waist. Now, I think you see on the video that's not what happened. So this whole statement of probable cause, this whole police report raises a lot of questions about this entire arrest. Now, a judge did rule about the officer demanding the ID. What was the ruling? And more importantly, what are your concerns about what happened during this seemingly illegal arrest? Well, tell you what's interesting here is the judge actually agreed. The judge ruled that the officer did not have the right to ID Paul at this point and, and, and really said, you know, that that was a, not a reasonable or even legal request for an ID. The only problem is the uh, judge did not rule that that actually vacated the entire charge of, you know, harming a police officer or, you know, assault and battery of a police officer. So really it didn't amount to much, but the truth is no matter what, Paul's First Amendment rights were violated. And also I think the entire charges of assault and battery are insane. Look at the video, read the police report. There is no evidence of it. For example, in the police report, the officer did not sustain any injuries. So how is that assault and battery? 
So anyway, uh, you know, I think it's good that the judge, you know, affirmed his constitutional rights. It's unfortunate for Paul that the legal system didn't work in his favor. And now I'm joined by Paul Brophy, the man who endured this police overreach and whose life has been profoundly impacted by these charges. Paul, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate the work you do. Honest to God, it's fantastic. So this encounter happened in a parked car. How did the police approach you? It was very simple, really. They, uh... I pulled in. It was a 24-hour store. I was doing two, two things. It was it was late in the morning. It was like 2.33 o'clock from what I recall. And I pulled into the store and uh, my passenger got out and went in. And I was sitting there with the, um, texting or something or looking at my phone. He came back out, got into the my vehicle. And um, I reached to start it up. Uh, obviously, we were getting gone. And uh, next thing I realized that there's two police cars, one pulled in behind me, preventing me from leaving. And the other, uh, first of all, it was just one car. And he pulled in behind me and immediately came to the window and um, started asking uh, questions, said they got a call and uh, can I get your ID, this and that. And my passenger gave up his ID right away. And I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, why do I have to give my ID in this position? Because uh, first, I hadn't done anything wrong. I had no idea why they were there. And secondly, I wasn't pulled over or anything. And it was then that the his backup came and he kind of took over. And as you can see from the video, I think it took him about 15 seconds uh, just to focus in on ID. So it became from then on ID, 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 as opposed to we're investigating, you know, we're asking you to stay here for a few minutes and we're going to talk to the clerk and do a proper investigation, right? But it turned out to be none of that. He told me that uh, they got a call that two people were running in and out of the store. There was nothing happening out of the ordinary, actually. So as you can see from the video, then he... Um, just started demanding ID. What do you think the suspicion of you and your passenger was? And did he ever really articulate his suspicion? He articulated a suspicion because he said they got a call of two people uh, walking in and out, running in and out of the store. So I told him I had no uh, problem going into the store to talk to the clerk. I hadn't even been in the store. Uh, my passenger went in and came back out. He did spend about five minutes in there. I recall thinking, well, is he coming or what's going on? But he did just come out and then we were going to leave. So I guess his articulate suspicion was uh, a suspicion that the store was going to be uh, robbed, I guess. But he did say that the suspicion he had was, uh, I can't recall his exact words on the suspicion, but he said, we got a call, uh, two guys coming in and out of the store, in a truck outside, and uh, that gave him enough suspicion to investigate, which meant that I was compelled to hand over my ID, and uh, I disagreed. Now, you chose to stand on your rights. Why did you do that? I think one of the reasons, one of the big reasons was because I had educated myself through uh, shows like yours and uh, First Amendment auditors. and. Uh, over the past year that I just really got into it and I could not believe the fact that how the police police here is uh, totally contrary to uh, the rights of the people. They don't, uh, I, believe, I think because most people just follow their uh, demands or their requests um, that they, uh, they continue to do it this way with disregard for people's rights that, you know, uh, in particular, your where you live, what your social security number is, what your background is, you know, and um, I figured all you had to do was run my plates anyways. It was my car. It was registered under me. It was insured. I had stickers. Everything was okay on the car. And um, so that was what prompted me. I had watched a lot of the videos and I had seen so many policemen um, and government officials just kind of walk over people's rights. Um, I decided to push back and just push it and see uh, 
get an explanation from him. And really, he, he came up with the same old kind of tried and trusted methods of, you know, where did you go to law school and uh, this type of thing, you know. So um, I just answered and tried to stay calm. And uh, I could see he was getting madder and madder. And I, I actually had to ask him to kind of de-escalate a little bit because I could feel his energy, you know. He wanted to drag me out of that car. He wasn't used to people, say, challenging him. And I didn't want to do it aggressively. Um, I just wanted to be on my way and, uh, you know, to this not to be an issue. So it turned into a big issue and it turned into a person losing their freedom and being put in a cell because they're stopped at a 24-hour store on their way over to drop some money off for my daughter is where I was going. And I was giving the passenger a ride to that town. It's kind of Metro Boston, you know? So I was giving my passenger a ride to that town, to uh, as far as that town. And he was on his own from there. It was very late. I couldn't drop him to where he needed to go. And he had a bicycle. So I was helping him out. And uh, on my way to do that, granted it was late in the morning, but that's nothing new for me. I mean, I'm out and about at all times, it's not suspicious to be out and about, right? So the officer started to escalate the situation. From my vantage point of watching, it seemed like you were reaching to close the car door. The officer said you were reaching for him. What happened in that moment? Exactly. That's the, the crucial moment, if you will. And it's, it's not clear on the video what happened. But what happened was, for some reason, I said, you know, OK, I'll, I'm, I'm going to get out of the car. But... He opened the door. You know, I didn't open the door. He, I went to unlatch my seatbelt. He opened the door and he came around, whereas uh, he was now between the door and me. So I said to him, well, why do you want me to get out of the car? And I reached out slowly. I mean, I, I know I've worked or I know a lot of cops. And I know that, you know, you don't make sudden movements. You don't do anything silly. And uh, I reached out for my door, but I reached out for my door, like, with the arm. But as I did, he grabbed me like that. And we both looked at each other, and you can hear it on the video. And he goes, okay, so now everything's changed. You reached out for me, and I have a taser, and I have a gun, and you grabbed my belt, my duty belt. And uh, I was just stunned. I'm like, oh, no, come on now. You know that that's not true or something. I said like that. Pulled me out of the car, as you could see, and uh, put me up against the uh, side of my car and uh, immediately cuffed me. And the other officer then said, you know, oh, I'm just going to charge him with uh, assault battery and a police officer. And they ended up doing that and uh, charging me with failure to ID. Were you surprised that the police officer escalated this to an arrest and the charges that came out? Well, surprised is uh, an interesting word. I think in one sense, absolutely, I was very surprised. But having educated myself and seen the uh, level of um, abuse, if you will, towards members of the public, uh, from videos and from your channel and the work you guys do. And I mean, some of it is just horrendous. And, you know, to think that the very fact that you stand on your rights, which is in my, in a perfect world, should be completely accepted if it's uh, grounded in fact and law, that they would uh, violate that. Now, call me naive, but I was thinking right from, there's no way that they will, ever get up on the stand or anything and just lie, right? And every, when, I, when I'd say that to people, they'd be like, really? So, you know, I went with uh, the proper course of the way to do things. And uh, sure enough, when I heard that and saw that and the reaction, the nonchalantness uh, in a court of law, I was, I was saddened. I was really sad about that and um, sad for the system and sad for... But, but it's kind of sad for myself as well. It's like, my God, they're not going to go do, do this route, are they? I could go to jail potentially here, you know? So we set a trial. Um, I was all for a trial. And uh, so it was my lawyer said I had a really good case and blah, blah, blah. And uh, all of a sudden, then, you know, I got this phone call from her and she said, oh, you need to come out to the court immediately. Um, after talking to the DA, talking to the judge, and uh, they're after offering you uh, a great deal and I think you should take it right away, you know. 
So I know I'm dis been disappointed with myself ever since, but I felt it a little bit. Uh, I was kind of pushed into it. I was on my own, you know. I didn't have an advisor. I didn't have uh, somebody to go over it with. But um, I went down to the court, and they were there, and she she was in the courtroom, and the judge, and they had offered me uh, three months probation with with no restrictions whatsoever. So this was at the very top, and it said abide by state and local laws, and you know the law, abide by the law, and in three months' time this will be dismissed. So I signed it, and uh, that kind of didn't sit well with me at all. I let it process without talking to my lawyer. And, but, you know, I did say to her, well, I thought we were going to go to trial on this. You seemed very confident, and you were, and she was in the text she sent me. And, but uh, they wanted clear cases, I guess. Just out of curiosity, did you actually have a license on you? Yeah, I did, yeah. I have my license on me, yeah, and I know, you know, the first lawyer I got, um, the, I ended up having to park company with him, but the first, um, I was so, I was so upset, but the first, uh, appearance in court where they assigned me a, a lawyer, the first thing he said to me, and he was actually mad. He's like, why didn't he just give me your ID? And I'm like, oh God, is this who's going to defend me? I don't know if that's going to work. And he walked away. Yeah. He came back with paperwork and he said there and walked away. So Anyway, it didn't work out with him after a while. Uh, I said, you know, I, I, I need a different lawyer. This is this is not your your attitude. Is your way of working is fine, but it's not for me, and I prefer. So I went to the court, and I, they they said, okay, they gave me uh, a different lawyer. So what were you charged with, and how long were you in jail? I was charged with uh, refusing to provide ID to a police officer on demand, and. Um, assault and battery on a police officer. That was, they were the two charges. Now you told me they didn't want to take you to trial, which is interesting because I think you would have done great on the stand. You had the truth on your side, no criminal history, well-spoken. I think you would have been great. So maybe they didn't want you to face a jury. Can you update me on the case? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, and thank you for saying that. I appreciate it uh, in regards to looking good on the the stand and everything and believable. And uh, I felt the, the same way, to be honest with you, because when you're telling the truth, you, you don't have to stammer or you don't have to, you know, make up more stuff. Uh, for me, to just to sit there and talk from my heart and tell the truth about what happened. So what happened from when she was appointed with me, we met a few times, kind of made me feel in a, a way that she's doing me a big favor at times, because I said to her, well, at one point I said, well, uh, whose side are you on here? Because she was leaning towards, well, why did you do this and that? And that's fine, you know, but she said to me, look, I am uh, I do private cases and I just take cases from the courts to uh, as uh, to be helpful in the community and stuff. And uh, I don't know about that after after what it went through, because it's it's you know, she needs cases. She wants charges, she needs uh, it's all uh, pretty good money for them. And uh, it's kind of free clients, if you will. Because of COVID, it was, the courts were shut down here in Massachusetts for quite a while. It, it opened up under a, um, the Zoom. So most of it was being done on video. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is four years later here. And, and you know, what happened to my, I think my Sixth Amendment uh, right here for a speedy trial? Then she called me to the court one day and she said, look, you need to come down here. The judge wants to hear, um, wants to, go over this and uh, I've gotten a great deal for you. I really think you should take it. Um, you know, it's totally non-restrictive probation for three months and you'll be, it'll be all dismissed and it'll be all gone. And, but as you know, well, it's, it's never gone. It's there. It's prevented me from getting jobs. I mean, this is a disaster, you know, to, to, to be charged with that, this. And then now I suppose I've kind of, in a way, um, accepted it because I took a punishment. Um, it's disastrous for my life. So how has this arrest affected you? Did you lose time for work or have to pay attorney's fees or a bond? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, you're not going to find out. Nobody's going to uh, email you back and say, well, we can't hire you because you've been um, accused of assaulting a police officer. But uh, I started testing the water here. I am. Um, I've got a graduate degree and I'm applying for uh, entry level positions. 
to see if I'm getting going to get any. <laughs> now I didn't. I took the graduate degree off. I just said I had a bachelor's degree, and um, I applied for dozens and dozens and dozens of jobs, and uh, and ninety percent I didn't even hear back from them because I think you know the norm now is for you know how easy it is to look up somebody's record, and once a person has your name and your address or whatever which you have on your your resume and all. Uh, so all I have is gig work right now. In fact, I was out of work for quite a while, long time. I know with COVID, it was obvious we were out of work, but I haven't had a steady job uh, since this happened, you know, and uh, it's unfortunate because I did spend uh, 20 years uh, serving the public myself. So, and I always knew who, you know, who I worked for. And I treated them with respect no matter what. Okay, now there are times when I talk about a specific law or right or even policy that directly relates to the misuses of police power. In other words, I try to drill down on one aspect of policing and the law and provide context and comprehension of the way bad policing affects our lives in ways that are often unacknowledged. But today, I'm gonna to speak in broader terms about what happened to Mr. Brophy and why I think an overlooked consequence of police power needs more attention. I mean, there are plenty of people who would look at the video we just parsed and characterize it as unremarkable. I imagine there are certainly a lot of people watching the show who would just shrug their shoulders and say, yes, these charges have made life difficult for Mr. Brophy, but the cop was just doing his job. What's the point of delving into this arrest any further? Well, let me take this question from a different perspective. Let me explore the idea of how police power affects the way we think, act, and even perceive ourselves and the freedoms we purport to cherish. Now, first of all, let's remember that for all those who think the cop was just doing his job, Consider for a moment what that actually means. Imagine if the officer's assertion that he has the right to demand an ID without probable cause is correct. If that's true, I want you to ponder what kind of power he actually has and what it implies about our rights. I mean, if a representative of the government can ask you to identify yourself anytime, anywhere, for any reason, we might as well just cross out the First Amendment of the Constitution that guarantees the right to peaceably assemble. And while you're at it, cross out the Fourth, because apparently you don't have the right to secure your personal effects from unwarranted searches and seizures. This means the government can arrest someone for protesting. This means if the government doesn't like your perspective, it can seize your property and simply do with it as it pleases. But there is an idea that transcends the law that I think warrants discussion in this case. The psychology, so to speak, of government power that is just as potent as the aforementioned incursion on our rights, but rarely gets the attention it deserves. That's because what the officer did to Mr. Brophy is not just about an arrest, contempt of cop, or simply a grumpy officer taking out his frustrations on an innocent man. It's not just a story of police overreach, misuse of the law, or another glaring example of the overarching power of a single cop. No, I think what we're seeing is symbolic of the broader contempt the government in general has for the people. I think it's meant to be a performative sort of power, indiscriminate, excessive, and most of all, indifferent. And that so-called performance has a message to quote our documentary Tax Broke, we are not worthy. What do I mean? Well, consider this recent series of stories regarding the inability of pharmacies to provide crucial drugs to people who need them. The report recounts how critical drugs to treat conditions like ADHD, anxiety, and opioid addiction are in short supply, prompting pharmacies to reject legal prescriptions. Now, this shortage is not related to the pandemic, the often shaky supply chain, or any other common manufacturing issue. It's not even a consequence of a lack of raw materials or some sort of effort by drug companies to raise prices. No, the problem is a shining example of how the performative power of policing and economic inequality are not just linked, but actually work in tandem. That's because the force behind this life-threatening shortage of crucial pharmaceuticals is no less than the government itself. I am not kidding. It is a result of a DA settlement with opioid manufacturers who flooded the country with billions of pain pills, raking in billions of profits, while hundreds of thousands of people died from overdosing. The settlement with the attorney generals of 48 states and the DAA led to huge fines 
but no jail time for the greedy executives. It also included a provision to monitor pharmacies for the sale of drugs that aren't even opioids, on the surface at least, to ensure the pills don't flood the market again. The settlement with attorney generals of 48 states and the DEA led to huge fines, but no jail time for the greedy executives. It also included a provision to monitor pharmacies for the sale of drugs that aren't even opioids to, on the surface at least, ensure that pills don't flood the market again. The expansive list includes not just the aforementioned laundry list of critical drugs, but even a medication known as Suboxone, which is used ironically, to treat opioid addiction through a process called replacement therapy. This system, put in place with little thought for who it would actually punish, is now causing pharmacies to be flagged for legally prescribed drugs and, as a result, cutting off crucial supplies needed by innocent patients. So let's unpack this little public policy jujitsu while I explain how it relates to the previously mentioned performative aspect of police power. So first, greedy drug executives flood the markets like big time drug lords with opioid pills, causing overdose deaths to skyrocket and profits to balloon. The federal government ignores the crisis until it becomes too big to hide under the proverbial protect the rich rock. But then, while crafting a settlement, the feds devise a plan that actually punishes average Americans even while maybe one or two executives ended up behind bars. Included in that stupendously thoughtless plan was to limit the availability of critical drugs that are used to treat the victims of the feckless, greedy drug company lords who caused the problem in the first place. I am serious. This is what our own government, which is supposed to serve the people, conjured from its how to screw things up manual, which incidentally is available online for a small fee. But back to my point at the beginning of this segment, the connection between police power and the ridiculously bungled response to the corporate sponsored addiction epidemic is part of a larger theme. Police in this case serve as a barometer, so to speak, a gauge of how the government actually views our rights and what they truly mean. The job of cops in this particular case is to perform for us the liturgy of the elites, a ritual that demonstrates to us clearly that we don't matter. But it is more than that, because this performative power, with of course real consequences, also convinces us that unjust policies like the ridiculous drug clampdown are in essence our fault. That is, we who are the ones who caused opioid pills to flood the market, while companies made billions off of human misery. From the ability to arrest us anywhere at any time flows the entire psychology that the reason your local drugstore can't obtain crucial medication to fulfill your prescription is actually you. What that cop told us with his indiscriminate and reckless use of government power is the same message that the elites were sending when they made a mess of a healthcare system already frayed at the edges. Keep your mouth shut, comply, or face the consequences of our massive indifference. And if you do push back, we will find the means through a minor arrest, conjured crime, or straightforward retaliatory sanction to make you take the blame. That's why the misuse of police power is not just about bad tickets, false charges, or unwarranted harassment. That's why a cop being able to demand your ID whenever and wherever they want is not limited to the indignity of the act itself. What it means is what it's designed to tell us about ourselves, that even though the Constitution says differently, our rights are subject to change. What it tells us is that no matter how many times Wall Streets or big banks or big pharma screw us, we only have ourselves to blame. Which is why Paul's decision to assert his rights is a more consequential act than it appears at first glance. That is, his insistence that he has the right to not comply with police is even more consequential than simply pushing back on an overbearing cop. It is instead an act of defiance that refutes the neoliberal blame game to punish the many to ensure profits for the few. It's the most consequential and imperative act there is, saying no to indiscriminate power, no to more policing, and no to the invasive and never-ending push to take our rights and sell them to the highest bidder. That's why we will continue to report on stories like these, and that's why we will always unpack and expose the system that makes what you witness on this show possible. Hopefully, by continuing our work, 
we can make it impossible for cops to act this way, but it is unlikely. But even a small step towards justice is worth taking in the longer journey of making our world a better place. I want to thank my guest, Paul, for joining us and for sharing his experience. Thank you, Paul. And of course, I have to thank intrepid reporter Stephen Janis for his writing, research, and editing on this piece. Thank you, Stephen. Taya, thank you for having me. And of course, I want to thank friends and mods of the show, Noli D and Lacey R for their support. Thank you. And a very special thanks to our Patreons. We appreciate you. And I look forward to thanking each and every one of you personally in our next live stream, especially Patreon associate producers, John R. and David K. And super friends, Shane Bushta, Pineapple Girl, and Chris R. And I want you watching to know that if you have video evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate. Please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can always message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter or Facebook. And please like and comment. You know I read your comments and that I appreciate them. And we do have a Patreon link pinned in the comments below if you feel inspired to donate. Accountability reports. And please consider doing so. We don't run ads or take corporate dollars. So anything you can spare is truly appreciated. My name is Taya Graham, and I'm your host of the Police Accountability Report. Please be safe out there. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.